When I first saw him standing up there on the sidewalk, I thought nothing of it. I certainly didn't think he'd still be out there come September. I lingered at the window for just a moment, decided that the night-bound silhouette across the street was just some guy out for a walk, and went to my room and hit the hay. As I stood blearily over the coffee maker the next morning, my eyes strayed up to the window over the sink, and a little shock of adrenaline removed the need for caffeine. He was still there, and still standing on the opposite sidewalk looking at my house. My roommates had all gone to work long ago, so I waited for my coffee, got dressed, then approached the front door and peered through the people. He was still there. I took a deep breath and readied myself for whatever nonsense this was going to entail and opened the door. His gaze shifted to me as soon as I stepped out on the porch, and he watched me as I walked across the grass. He tensed when I stepped onto the sidewalk, but then looked relieved when I crossed it and reached the curb. Stopping there, I kept the pavement between us. I didn't know exactly how to ask him what the hell he was doing. Hey, um, what's up? He looked at me a bit nervous. Oh, no, nothing, just hanging out. From where I was standing, he didn't appear to be homeless or crazy. He was just a man, about forty, dressed in a black and blue robe, and I vaguely recognized him. Don't you live in that house? I pointed up the driveway behind him. He nodded. Oh, yeah, uh, that's me. Yeah, I just came out to get the newspaper. I glanced down at his hand where he held an orange bag with the newspaper rolled up inside it. Well, looks like you got it. I paused. Another orange bag was lying further up the driveway, as if the one he was holding actually was yesterday's. He didn't say anything. He just stood there with a masked, nervous expression. Did I see you out here last night, too? Yeah, and that was me. I looked down further and saw that his feet were bare. You weren't out here all night, were you? I expected him to laugh off the idea, but instead he replied, I was. You've been out here all night in bare feet? Panic was oozing out from under his mask of calm politeness in a dozen different ways. Yeah? Now I was starting to feel more than a little worried. Are you going to stand out here all day, too? I, um... He strained to speak, but then seemed to change his reply. I might. Um, it's beautiful weather out. Well, that much was true. It was a warm summer day. It's bright and beautiful. Well, could you at least not stare at my house, then? He began to give an apologetic shrug, but then stopped halfway through the motion and tried to turn. His bare feet never lifted from the sidewalk. His attempt to turn was more of a twist from his thighs up. That, too, stopped rather quickly, and then he said, Um, his gaze moved in a circle before he finally looked directly at me. Your house is nice. I like looking at it. By then I was getting rather annoyed. Um, what is your name? Uh, Russ. Russ. It's nice to meet you. Um, I shook my head. I never had to do this before. If you don't stop being weird and staring at our house, I'm going to call the police. His eyes lit up. Yes, yes, please do that. That was a weird enough reaction that I actually got out my phone. I'd been raised to never involve the police for any reason, but this was abnormal enough that I felt I had to. I told the dispatcher we had a strange man standing outside of our house and he'd been there literally all night. Yes, all night. She said two officers would be with us shortly. Russ didn't talk much while waiting for them. He just stood there looking at me at random times and around the neighborhood otherwise. Ours was a quiet street, populated by nice people who kept mostly to themselves. We'd never even had cause to really meet each other. If we had, I might have known more about Russ. But as things were, he's just some guy acting strangely. Although his aura of masked nervousness calmed, as a squad car turned down the lane and approached us. Two uniformed officers climbed out and approached us with tired stances. One asked dismissively, What seems to be the problem here, gentlemen? Russ looked up to me, hopefully. I told them, This guy has been standing out here staring at my house all night long. The second cop rolled his eyes, but he did ask Russ, Is that true, sir? 
Russ gulped and stated, Yes, yes. Both cops straightened up at the unexpected answer. The first one asked, Seriously? Russ nodded. The second cop looked at each of us for a moment and then said, Well, move it along then. Russ tensed up and stood a little taller. No. What? I, I said no. As the pair began walking toward him, he added, Sir, as one got out handcuffs, the other sneered and said, Little asshole. But he stopped about two feet from Russ. His partner froze as well. Come on, Russ urged. What are you waiting for? C come on, c come on. The two men looked at each other with haunted expressions and began to back away. The handcuffs were returned to their belt. No, no, Russ shouted at them. Do it, you pricks, you, you pigs, you ugly bastards. Come on, beat me up, teach me a lesson, knock me down. The first cop's face was pale. You're fine, sir. You're, you're, you're absolutely fine. We're, we're pigs. We're just, just do what you like. Stand there as long as you want. You're on your property, technically, so this, this is none of our business. The second glanced at me with an apologetic terror. Both jumped in their car and peeled away. Russ screamed incoherently after them, but did not move from his spot on the sidewalk. I called the station a second time and asked what happened, but after taking my address, the dispatcher told me never to call again and hung up. The anger faded out of Russ as he saw me lower the phone, and I stood there awkwardly as the grown man across the street began to outright cry. I'd never seen a forty-year-old man blubber from sheer hopeless terror. But Russ, what's going on? He couldn't answer past the tears. Looking left and right first, I initially stepped onto the street and got near him. I had the strangest notion, but I couldn't articulate it. The words simply wouldn't come to mind, and instinctual awareness was the most I could manage. I did reach the opposite curb right in front of him, and I was intent on pushing him back off his spot on the sidewalk, but I changed my mind about two feet away from him. It would be weird to touch a crying grown man. I stepped back to the street, confused. I tried a second time two feet away from him, literally within arm's reach. I changed my mind. He could do what he liked. <laughs> Who was I to interfere if he wanted to stand outside on a beautiful day? <laughs> Each time I got close and then changed my mind, his tears and terror deepened. I remember murmuring, all right, screw this, and I backed up to the middle of the street to get some space for a running start. I couldn't articulate what I was doing, but I guess a leaping tackle might work. I braced myself and then launched forward, ready to spring up and pro ready to spring up at a proper distance. But as I went to jump at him, I changed my mind. There was nothing wrong with being. There was nothing wrong. I was just being silly. Who cared about any of this anyway? I slowed down and curved away. His sobbing became a river. Despite an overwhelming sense that something was very wrong, I turned and slowly went back inside. I could still see him through the kitchen window, and I began going about the business of my day with a muted horror that I could not acknowledge gnawing at my heart. Each time I looked, I would hope against hope that he had moved, but he was always still there, shaking, crying, looking around for help. That was June. Paul hung over our neighborhood, where once my roommates and I had held board game parties and a dozen people over. Now we ate meager meals in silence. Whenever one of us would think to talk about something that had happened at work, or perhaps an event we were looking forward to, we would get out half a sentence and then be overwhelmed by a sense of hollowness. Who could care about a concert or a trip to a water park at a time like this? We would stop our sentence midway through and glance out of our kitchen window as a group. Always. Russ was still standing there. He successfully avoided dangerous sunburns by lifting his robe over his head during the brightest hours and he had a few nearby trees to shade him at other times. His bare feet took the worst of it, and were red and boiled over after a week. During that second week, we gathered daily as a neighborhood. It was impossible not to have noticed him standing out there by then, and all the various residents of our street wandered out to speak to him and one another about various polite topics and with strained undertones. Terrible weather, the neighbor would say, her eyes fearful. The weather was gorgeous and beautiful. Absolutely terrible weather now, another of us would say. Horrifying, in fact. What the hell is happening with the weather? I remember the oldest of us, a woman who had lived through the Great Depression and was nearly tough as nails, then cried openly and sobbed. Why, why, 
Why is the weather doing this? Russ stood through all of this. Why don't you just go inside? He could only shrug and shakily tell her. I don't want to go inside. I like sunburns on my feet. She approached him with both hands up to throttle him, but changed her mind as she came within reach. Oh, you're... You're a man. You can... You can take it. I, I shouldn't have interrupted your enjoyment of nature. She hobbled away in tears, trembling violently. Another of our neighbors stepped forward. Well, at least take these clothes. He held out a folded shirt and pair of jeans, but turned away before getting close enough to hand them over. Uh, you, you probably don't want my dirty old hand-me-downs. Right. Russ replied hopelessly. I'm fine. Thanks, though. It was the rainy season in our parts, and it began to drizzle on our heads, so, so we retreated to our home and gazed out the window to watch Russ thirstily hold open his mouth to the sky. Once the torrent was heavy enough, he could also lean down and scoop water from the flow running along the curb. That gave us an idea. As a neighborhood, we began to wash our cars more often. The runoff from the house would flow past Russ, allowing him to drink and stay alive, but only for as long as was normal for washing one's car. None of us mentioned to one another, we just saw others doing it, so we did it too. The rainy season also brought worms up from the ground, which he ate, and he learned to stand still long enough for birds to come over, who would grab them and eat them whole. The sidewalk near him became foul with waste until each new rain washed it clean. One of the men on the street began building a long wood and metal contraption. For the first time in a month, we had something else to see outside our window, and we watched him for nearly a week before getting a sense of what he was doing. It was a massively long Rube Goldberg machine full of levers, swing hammers, rolling balls, and other assorted nonsense. From the two by fours he had laid out, he'd planned for it to extend all the way down the street, around the corner and out of sight. My roommates and I took a few days off of work and wordlessly began helping. The older woman in the neighborhood brought out drinks and food for us. Russ looked on while we ate and drank, but he watched especially carefully while we worked. I'd never been one for tools, but I muddled through, figuring out how to saw and nail things effectively, and the other men in the neighborhood joined us without a word when they saw how serious we were. It took six days, but we finally finished the contraption on the eve of a big storm. As the sky was growing dark, we gathered around the corner of the site. We gathered around the corner, out of sight of Russ, and stared at the button that would activate the machine. If all the levers and hammers and contraptions worked, Russ would be knocked over by a battering ram mechanism at the very end. We stared at the button. A jogger approached, and we stared at her. She slowed and looked worried that thirty odd people were watching her. We backed up and glanced at the button repeatedly. You want me to push this? She asked, cautious but concerned. Uh, is this for some sort of prank video? We looked at each other, and the old woman who had survived the Great Depression shrugged and nodded. The jogger moved close, offered her hand over the button before backing up. No, no, I'd, uh, I'd rather not participate in a prank video. Her expression was fearful and pain. She jogged on as we stood in despair. The storm came and destroyed most of the mechanism. The man who'd started it took it down in grief-stricken silence. Over the course of the next week, Russ watched that process with despondent eyes. A moving truck pulled up one morning, and we gathered on the street to watch his wife begin packing things. Russ lost his job because he hasn't been showing up, she explained. Now we can't afford this place anymore. She looked over at him with narrowed eyes and said hatefully, I don't understand why he's doing this. I'm not staying with an unemployed loser who would rather stand around all day than do some honest work. This is honest work, he called over, crying despite his words. It's tough standing here without rest. I do get tired, but s someone has to do it. We watched her put Russ's son in the passenger seat, then drive off with most of the contents of the house. We looked at Russ. He gulped, wiped his tears away, and gave the flimsiest reasoning I've heard yet. It's more important that I stand here and go after my family. I didn't value them anyway. He seemed to give up after that, letting the sun sear his flesh day after day, not even bothering to eat the worms that followed each storm. That was July. The first party our street had seen in months nearly sparked a riot. Our place was one of the two of the street designated as off-campus housing, and the other house kicked off a kegger at about 
Seven o'clock one night, outrage and anger flowed with us in the foyer of the house. The college guys therein turned down the music and had their friends hang back a second as the entire house crowded in. The old woman asked, What the hell do you think you're doing? I was actually the one who spoke next. I remember my righteous anger vividly. How can you have a party when things are the way they are? One of the guys who lived there protested. So what? We're supposed to just uh, stop everything and not live our lives because the way things are? The guests looked at us in confusion. The most painful part about that argument was that the guys were right. We couldn't just stop our lives because of what was happening on our street. The shouts and yells from each side were more about how we felt than any logical debate. And a fist fight broke out just long enough to kick over the keg and break two glasses. We held each other back and retreated as a neighborhood, leaving the college guys to their party. I was bitter. So bitter. And we all felt that bitterness together. Until another neighbor at a party two nights later. A week after that, one of my roommates had our friends over for a board game night. And I had to admit, it felt like such a relief to return to normalcy. At the end of the night, I walked the last of our friends out, said one last joke and laugh, and then waved after them. Russ was just a silhouette in the darkness, always there, but no longer in our minds all the time. Of course, the next morning, the guilt hit me like a load of bricks as I stood over the coffee maker and studied the boil-covered red scarecrow across the street. His blue robes were growing tattered after months outside, and he looked like a burned corpse. Unfortunately, I had a stressful day ahead. I couldn't afford to process my guilt at the moment. I'm ashamed to admit it, but I was the one who did it. I closed the blinds over the kitchen window. It was, it was supposed to have been just for the day, just so I could get through the big project at hand. But the blinds never came back up after that, as a house, as a group. We stopped looking out the window, just like washing our cars. Just like working on that Rube Goldberg machine, and just like our reaction to the party, my neighbors took that as a clue. Within five days, all the blinds and all the windows and the entire street were lowered. That first night, the rust was completely alone outside in the darkness, with all the blinds closed, an absolute guarantee that nobody was looking out for him. I laid in bed, staring at my ceiling and crying quietly. This was not like the other pains on the street. Not like the ones that we couldn't articulate. I knew exactly what I'd done this time. And I could think and say the words since it was my issue and my guilt alone. I was the first one to close the blinds. I wanted to be the first to raise them again. To look out onto our neighborhood problem and force everyone else to open their eyes and unite again. But I didn't have the courage. I needed to work. I uh, needed to pay rent. I couldn't be the one because raising my blinds would mean acknowledging the problem and I couldn't afford to be racked by guilt and confusion and pain any longer. Each night, I prayed that someone else would be the first to raise their blinds. Sure, surely, surely someone else would do it. It was the only conscious path and someone would definitely feel compelled to do the right thing. Then, we could all do it together. I'd put the issue out of my thoughts for so long that I was actually startled when I saw Russ healthier than before. With nobody mowing his lawn or trimming the trees, and with an abnormally rainy season, the greenery around him had grown to shade him nearly the entire day. His skin was back to a decent color where crinkled parchment had peeled off, and a large number of crickets and other bugs had taken up residence on his waist-high lawn. On these, he fed reaching down to grab insects at random and eat them when the urge struck him. I'd looked because a car had pulled up, and I'd watched as a real estate lady got out and began pestering him. Hey! I shouted from across the way, defensive of our issue. You leave Russ alone! This is ridiculous! She called back. I need to sell this property. I'm never going to get a buyer interested in the property with a weathered homeless man standing outside of it. He's not homeless! I shouted at her. That's his home! Not anymore! His wife got a divorce because he failed to show up for the hearings. I don't know why I said it. I meant the sidewalk! Somehow, I s somehow, at some unknown point, I'd accepted it simply the way things were. The real estate lady glared at me, and then Russ. 
Then she got into her car and left. I knew what would happen next. Then my roommates and I harassed the landscaping crew she'd sent until they got fed up and left too. If they mowed the lawn and pruned the trees, Russ would be in serious trouble. We congratulated ourselves for a job well done, went back into our house for a board game night. That was August. The derisive talk began earlier this month, as the first chill of autumn hit the air. I think people instinctively knew that the worst was yet to come for him. Someone would spit and call him an idiot for standing there like that. Why doesn't he just go inside? Someone would ask. No. What a dumbass, someone else would say. I just stared at him when they said things like that. I did wish it would stop. That he would stop. But I, I don't I don't know. I just I just don't know. I was prompted to write this and share our situation because I saw it in myself. I saw myself turning toward blame and hatred. I asked the same questions. So why, why was he doing this? Why, why wouldn't he just go inside? But the strange dread notion that I could not articulate drove me to go outside and do something no one else had done in weeks. Talk to him. Hey, Russ, I said by way of opening, since I had no idea what else to say. His hair was a mane, his beard was wild, but there was still a man under there. He coughed and cleared his throat and then managed to say, <coughs> Hey! There was really no beating around the bush. You gave up for a little while there, didn't you? He nodded weakly. What changed your mind? Why are you eating and drinking again? Why do you fight so hard to survive? I asked him, my heart full of compassion. I felt like I was such a great person for caring when no one else did, but I'll never forget his bemused, angry laugh. He tilted his head and said, <laughs> To stick it to, to you assholes. That was the one answer I'd never expected. We'd done so much for him, gone through so much guilt and angst and effort, but I guess I'd never thought about what it was like on the other side of the blinds, standing there night after night, knowing the entire neighborhood was avoiding looking at you. I don't have an answer. I don't have any answers. I wanted to tell him good luck, but it would have sounded hollow. I nodded and went back inside. This time I raised the blinds and stood by the kitchen window. As the first flakes of snow for the season began to fall, I accepted his angry gaze. Would the heat of his hate be enough to warm him through the winter? Summer seems impossibly far away, especially without so much as a blanket. And yet, all the people who come over, all my friends and roommates and acquaintances, all just keep asking idly, why doesn't he just go inside? If only it were that simple. Hello everyone. If you enjoyed this story, be sure to check out the author's book on Amazon called A Shattered Life, which contains a collection of their writing. And if you enjoyed this video or the music that I composed for it, make sure to like and subscribe. With that said, have a good night.